Uh, my name is Gary Ernest Smith. I have been a professional artist for about 50 years, 50 some years now, and um, we artists all have our mentors that we all kind of look up to. And uh, we study them, we copy them, we uh, learn from their techniques and so forth, and eventually we kind of move on to our own subject matter and uh, over a period of time we develop our own styles and so forth. I was always really interested in Maynard Dixon's work. He was, Maynard was a, was a real influence in my life. Uh, it had to do with uh, the, not the subject matter so much as the fact that uh, he was so precise in what he did. He was very, very uh, unique in terms of, of um, being able to take a plain air painting, for instance, and project that into a larger, larger piece in minimal, minimal amounts of time. He was able to, to, to take uh, subject matter and, and reduce it down to its essence. And uh, much, of the, uh, much of the work he did over his lifetime, uh, he developed into this, this kind of a shorthand method that became very, very unique to him and to his, uh, his audiences and so forth. So he became very recognizable in his time. Uh, his, um, he went through a whole period of um, early illustration in his life and eventually got into fine art painting and spent the rest of his life uh, developing uh, different types of... Uh, a work in the American West and, and captured really the quaint, quintessential artwork uh, of the West. At the time, he wasn't particularly successful in his career, but yet he was uh, he was successful and he, he made a living from it. But he wasn't he was never very very uh, financially successful with his work. But it was uh, collected from time to time by. Um, important people and got into some, some nice universities and, and museum collections and things like that. But it wasn't until after he died some 50 years later, which is very, very common in the art world, for artists to be, to be sorted out to the point where their work becomes um, known for, for what it is and that uh, his, uh, his work um, became as important as it is uh, and renowned as it is today. And has influenced a whole generation of artists particularly the young artists now that are coming up that are painting Western uh, scenes and so forth. You see many of them saying, you know, artists that uh, Maynard was really the, the great influence in, in the work that they do. And a lot of them, you know, we've all copied Maynard, of course, you know, we've, we've uh, tried, to, uh, tried to emulate what he did with his work, trying to get to the essence of what we want to do with his work. But um, this painting, uh, uh, to the right of me here is a really good example of er, uh, work that he was doing out um, on location and doing studies and so forth. I think, I have a feeling it probably was um, probably, um, um, probably a studio painting that was developed in the studio that he actually took more time on. And you can tell the difference between his, his early studies of, um, of um, plein air painting from his... Uh, the studio pieces. And this is, this is a much more developed piece, but this painting is really a good example of where so many young artists have gone today. Going out in the American West, he kind of showed the way for, um, for artists to, to come later as to what he did and, and find the beauty, in the, nat the natural beauty in, in uh, uh, the American West and particularly in the rugged qualities of the American West. And a lot of this was Nevada, Utah, Arizona, that he spent a good deal of his time. So um, um, he, he, would, um, he would generally start a painting by doing a, kind of a basic um, tonal underlay and then just slowly build that up. And you can see in, in the shadows and all of that, it's very, very well thought out. Uh, he didn't do a lot of preliminary work, of preliminary, like doing sketches. He did do some, and we do have studies of those. And we do to have the, the drawings and so forth, but he primarily just went right directly to his subject. So I think we could call this as one of the real quintessential pieces that we could point to as being a, a very, very developed piece that has had a lot of influence and really shows off the beauty of the American West. This painting is kind of a unique painting in terms of what Maynard did. Uh, he didn't go to the greens and, and, so, and uh, these colors so much. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure where this would have been. It's, probably, it's a studio painting and it's uh, partially um, um, made up 
you know, he probably had a very, very, a very strong idea about the mountain and so forth he wanted. But if you look at the clouds and so forth, which are so dramatic, that's created out of his mind. And he's taking this little uh, vignette down here of the uh, cattle and the horse, the horses and the horsemen down here, and he's added just a little interest to it. The, they're overpowered by the drama of the of the subject, but beautifully painted and. Uh, you know, some of his paintings uh, were quick. Sometimes they would take a day, sometimes hours. These paintings, these studio paintings, would actually take more time. And a painting of this size was, was kind of unique to Maynard, although he did do murals and things also. But um, I think that this, this shows the drama that he can actually create in a piece of art. And it's the simplicity in which it's done, uh, the, uh, the sense of... Um, design, very powerful design and so forth. And he, he, just, he just really had that knack. He wasn't, he wasn't a trained artist. He had never really went to school. He didn't like the art school that he had tried to attend and so forth. But he just learned on his own and he just, he just was a genius in what he was able to do and see. And um, that's, that's why he is so revered today that uh, he, his, his work was um, uh, really revealed an awful lot about not only himself but his time and uh, he used a lot of contemporary styles and things in his work that he would experiment with and I think this is a good example of just pure design really really powerful uh, design and and, uh, and creating a, a, a work of art. Okay this is another really good example of some of the uh, uh, work that, that uh, Maynard um, developed, created, and developed that has influenced many, many people today. Uh, there's something about the strength of those values and the color and everything that really is compelling and draws people to it. And uh, you'll see that the subject matter, the, what, he's, what you're focusing on is a very strong patterns of design and so forth. Um, a very, very small hint of foreground in it. So he's focusing in on you, those, those beautiful shadows. And uh, beautifully well and well designed. Probably would have uh, created in the studio. And um, you can tell by the way the paint is applied and so forth and how, uh, how much of the canvas he's actually covering. And we'll talk pretty soon about some of those paintings that maybe are um, more studies. And there's a difference between them. So. Uh, this painting uh, exhibits a lot of, of the genius of Maynard Dixon. It is so simple and so direct. If you were out in nature just observing that, you probably wouldn't see much to paint there. But what he was able to do was to bring in that uh, um, mesa back here, the color of that mesa, slightly bring in detail and so forth. If you look at this up close, some of the paint is very thin in this. But then you get in the sky and some of the places where he's actually gone in, into the clouds and has painted into uh, more, uh, more, more, we call it fat paint. And, um, and brought these interesting clouds into it. But it's very, very, very simply done. And that's really the genius of, of Maynard Dixon is, is knowing how to capture the essence of something. And, um, and he's doing this because he's inspired by these subject matters that he's seeing. He's not doing it just to make money. In fact, most of his artwork is a reflection of just plain uh, living, living life and being inspired by the objects around him. And they wound up in galleries and so forth, and they were for sale, and he did sell his work. But he did have a lot of his paintings were still left in his studio, as Harold R. Clark found out when he went and purchased the paintings from Maynard. And this collection, the majority of this collection, belongs to BYU. That many of his great paintings he could not sell. He just kind of had them around the studio. Uh, this is one of Maynard's um, iconic pieces. Uh, it evokes a lot of thought when you see it. He's not telling us what's going on here but he's implying that there is something going on with these hooded figures moving towards something. But the power and the beauty of this is in the fact that this is a kind of a monumental group of, the, of these robed figures with, with dark faces. And it creates a, a mystery about it that makes you want to know more. Uh, he actually did some studies of this and he did some drawings in preparation. Sometimes when an artist is doing a a subject and if it has complexity to it or or it has um, iconic 
values to it that go beyond reality or you're trying to say something specifically with it, uh, you will work that out as sketches and so forth until you get the right thing. And he did, there's some studies that were done of actually done of this. For, and it's a larger piece, it was a piece that was important to him and he did a number of these hooded figures. Um, he did one of a hooded, uh, a hooded figure with a, a large rock with a woman standing in front of that rock. And you know, they're provocative pieces, we don't know exactly what he was implying with that. But when you stop and look at it, you want to know, and you get caught up in, you know, the, the visual side of it. Another really masterfully beautiful he designed painting. Uh, the poplar trees, you know, which were trees were planted by the pioneers because they were fast-growing trees. And cottonwood trees, they were, they were fast-growing trees. And um, poplar trees become very dangerous, you know, when they get old because they fall over easily. But um, the pioneers would, build, would build, uh, plant those in relationship to the homes they built. This happens to be, I believe, an abandoned home that he saw. But this is in southern Utah somewhere. I'm not sure exactly where. But um, uh, an interesting, and he was able to, he was really able to take... Um, color like uh, yellow leaves from a, from a cottonwood tree against that, those blue skies. And if you ever see that out in nature, it's just stunning. And he was able to really capture those things. But the, the real beauty of this painting is the way this thing is designed and the way that house falls into the back here. This is a studio painting. This was done, you know, under control. Um, we'll show some of them that they were out of control. For pretty <laughs> not out of control, but not con not a controlled element, and they're they're different than these other paintings. So, this is a really good example of a plein air piece. Plein air means you're doing it on location. I'll bet he doesn't have any more than an hour and a half in this painting, and basically he's doing is roughing this in, and you can tell by the how uh, uh, the uh, the uh, quality of the paint below is very thin, and washed. And it comes up in, he's, he's added a little more detail into this. He's actually painted more paint into a sky area. But this is a really good example of what he, would, what he would do when he would go out in nature, set up your easel, and look at your subject, design that quickly on the canvas, and paint it as quickly as you can. One of the real problems in plein air painting was, is, the light source changes almost constantly. So you go to the areas that you want to paint that you know are going to change quickly. So he would go to the buttes and to the, all the crevices where the shadows were because he knew those were going to change. Now they may have been more beautiful, you know, two hours or something. But what he did was he captured the, the light coming in at that time. I would guess that's probably a, some, probably a noon painting, kind of from the light source that you see here. But a good example of just, a, just going out and just uh, doing a quick study. Uh, this painting is one of his real masterpieces, I think. It, it, it probably, probably is no, no more than two hours in this painting. Um, the person posed for him. You can see, you, you, can't, you, can't per, you can't paint the personality in someone if you don't see it. And the genius that, uh, any, uh, that Maynard was able to do in very, very quick and short order, he was able to capture personalities as well as the reality of the subject. And uh, beautifully designed with, with light and dark values. Notice the way the, the shadow comes down across the face and across the robe here. And he's taken three colors and painted that robe in there. And it is so accurate and so precise that he never went back and painted on this after he did, he went through this one time. And you can usually tell by that because if you see paint build up somewhere or you see a slight change of value, you know they went back and, and worked on this. Again, this painting was done all, of, all at once. And, um, uh, you know, you never know how a subject is going to react to it once you see it. But the Indian people in Taos were... Uh, used to the painters that are using them as models. And so Maynard went around and did a lot of, uh, a lot of subjects in, in the Taos area before he decided to leave. And I think the winter was a little strong for him in, in Taos. It got pretty, pretty, pretty bad. But uh, anyway, one of his real masterpieces. Um, Maynard, along with his wife, Dorothea Lang, got caught up in the uh, Forgotten Man series during the Depression. 
he had a lot to say. A lot, he wrote a lot about it. He wrote poems about it. He, uh, uh, he was influenced by her. She was influenced by him. She was a photographer. She was photographing basically the same thing that he was painting. Um, his um, No Place to Go uh, is really masterfully painted. It's, it's got this, you can tell that, uh, you know, it's painted around the ocean. Um, it's a man looking, a forlorn man looking, looking down that valley there, who knows for what. And, uh, but his, his uh, use of lights and darks in this and the placement of his figures and the way that fence comes down the hill and it leads you down and leads you back up and uh, the ocean against these strong and powerful forms with him silhouetted almost against those forms. The light f form, if you, uh, if you really study this and if you were to do a, a uh, mathematical interpretation of some of Maynard's paintings, he, he actually laid some of his paintings out mathematically. It was in his mind, but he was using he was using such things as, um, if you've ever or know anything about the golden section in art, it was um, a device used by artists to make you see things more precisely and better. And he knew and understand these things too, and he would use them in his paintings. If you'll notice the placement of figures oftentimes, in fact, almost all the paintings in here have the figure located almost in the same place in the canvas. Almost in the same place. And that's right on a, a one-third, two-third ratio. And um, I just, the simplicity of this painting, yet, yet the, the overall power of the painting and the subtlety of it and everything, has got everything about it. This is a good example as, as to why Maynard Dixon is revered today as one of the great American artists. He's right up there in the, in the minds of many of the historians with Edward Hopper and a whole group of Eastern artists. And um, he wasn't so much in his own day. Uh, he was uh, thought of as a great painter, but he was not revered in certainly in the way he is now. And the way we revere people today as we see it, how much money they have make on an auction. Well, he would have looked at that and said, well, you know, that really still doesn't have much to do with art. <laughs> what you make in art doesn't necessarily mean that you are a great artist. But yet, because he was so so good at what he did and, he, and his point of view and everything was so, um, so unique that over... Over the last, it's taken about 50 years before to see him really begin to come to the forefront. And that's kind of the way it is with an artist. With all the artists are out there in the world and everybody wants to be famous, okay? You want your work to be revered and lasting. It takes about 50 to 60 years for an artist to really settle through all of the fluff out there in the world and for the best to rise to the top. And Maynard uh, is, was able to do this as revered as one of the great American artists. And this is a good example of why. His, his um, Forgotten Man series is unique. Uh, people didn't like them. He, he couldn't sell them. He couldn't even really show them. It was too close to home and it was too real for people. And it hasn't been until the last 50, 60 years that we began to see that what he was really able to capture with these. And that he captured the whole feeling of the period and of the people and the despair and so forth, some people. Uh, this, this piece I have seen for most of the paintings in the Forgotten Man series, I have seen studies for. And I think it was because he was trying to really get to the essence and the feeling of how people were really uh, relating to depression and what was happening to them. This, he probably never saw that exactly happen this way, but he, was, he did a drawing. I've seen a drawing of that man, a preliminary drawing of that man. And he's placed him in this situation where he's making a statement about, about uh, uh, the despair of those, the, how, how people felt. And so when you look at these paintings, you get, the, you get the essence of what the depression was really all about. And, um, and that there were a lot of people that without jobs and you know, hanging out on the streets and so forth. And uh, we were able to see that to some degree today in our culture too. I mean, a bit, in a big degree, in a different kind of way. But um, uh, this, was, this really, really affected he and Dorothea Lang both, and she did a lot of uh, photographs 
of people during the Depression also that have gotten to be iconic works. But this is an iconic work of, of Maynard's. This is, this is one you see in the books that represent that period. And, uh, and it, it affected him greatly too when he, was, when he was painting these. We don't have a lot of history about how this painting came to be, but we do know he was living in, Mar in Mount Carmel up out of Zion's Canyon at this time and lived there for um, a while with his wife and today uh, they have a little kind of little museum there. I mean the people that own that uh, prop property now. Uh, we, we, I've been to, a, to some uh, Maynard Dixon paint outs and so forth that they've had there. And, um, and they still maintain that. You can still look across the canyon, you can see the paintings that Maynard did, you know, and it's um, a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, we don't know the whole history of this. He would have had to do some real hiking to actually get up there, but there's no doubt he did. And we think probably he didn't, he didn't take any photographs of it, but, um, we, but there's a pretty good chance that he did sketches of it. But the thing that's so interesting about it is he, uh, you think of the red rocks and everything. This is really, really very subtle in terms of reds. Um, he's got, you got those beautiful pastel, um, purple colors back there, the blues and so forth, that really define the great white throne and, and some of the other elements in there. And then he's kind of brought the red into some of these sharp edge rocks and so forth. And then this beautiful foreground of the rock and the trees. How this stands out so much from that, and that's just this gen that's the genius of, of Maynard. The way but he was put, able to put this together. This is a studio painting too, of course. You wouldn't be able to pack all your stuff up there and do a plein air piece, you know. But um, just one of his real great pieces. And BYU is really lucky to have this piece as a Utah piece, you know. So.